with David Weinberger, who I'm happy to see personally as an old friend and who is here to give a talk in an hour or so about his new book, uh, and it's about everyday chaos and what that may mean in a building that celebrates uh, journalism and the idea of information uh, having some valuable positive impact in the world. And my first question is, what do you mean by chaos? Well, it's an excellent question. Um, so there are uh, several meanings. I mean sort of a combination of several. So it's um, maybe appropriately, it's not entirely well defined in the book. Um, so some have taken, uh, because the, the book celebrates chaos. It's in favor of chaos, you know, recognizing the limitations and issues and the rest of it. But, um, and there's one of the first meanings of chaos is people who are living in desperate uh, times and places undergo a type of chaos that is not something anybody wants to go through. It's just destabilizing uh, inconsistency and danger and risk. And that's not what I mean, a perfectly reasonable sense of chaos. Um, there's a mathematical sense, which I kind of sort of mean to play off of. I am not a mathematician, um, but chaos theory has uh, several such signature elements of chaos, and the book does um, use those outside of the uh, mathematical framework in which they operate most comfortably. And there's a, a third sense of chaos, which is primarily the one that I mean, although uh, so, it, um, from chaos theory, I'm taking I take the idea that uh, chaotic systems are both very complex and often very large, that they are very sensitive to initial conditions, um, that they they often are nonlinear or contain nonlinear elements, in the sense that um, a simple small cause can um, have large effects. That's the butterfly effect from chaos theory, or a um, a cause a, a cause operating on something has very predictable, stable, linear results until sort of uh, something flips in the system, and then it starts the causes start uh, having different effects. Um, and then there's the third sense, which is the sense in which. Um, we can think about our own lives as being chaotic. It's the sort of chaos that um, some of the ancient Greeks, the pre-Socratics and, and Socratics even, recognize all around them, the unpredictability of events, um, the, the swirl, the, the apparent swirl of perceptions that we try to make sense of. Um, so that, that's a third sense, and I'm thinking about it mainly in terms of the all that it Everything that had to happen in order for you to get splashed by a car going down the road this morning um, on your way to work. Uh, it's almost completely unpredictable. The set of things that had to happen from the rainfall and the gutters and the car being there and you being in the right spot, et cetera, it's functionally unpredictable. Um, and our lives are characterized, in my view, um, more by that than they are by the by the sort of the guardrails. Is that the right metaphor? Sort of the markers that we use to um, construct a story of our lives. And the uh, essential idea of the book is we historically understand ourselves and our world through the dominant technology. At least going back to to Newton and the. Uh, mechanical watches giving us our sense of how the world works, and uh, more recently, of steam engines, where we, the steam age, when we started to feel under pressure and venting, and we actually feel ourselves under pressure, even though it's a metaphor from the steam age. Uh, Freudianism, uh, a bunch of Freudianism comes from that era as well, and the, the information age, where we experience information, and I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's become an important part of how we understand ourselves. Um, the book um, argues, uh, in some sense, that the internet and now um, machine learning, AI, machine uh, in the form of machine learning, um, are our dominant technologies and are shaping how we experience our own lives and how we think about how the world works. And those two technologies, for reasons that the book tries to go through, um, enable us to see the chaos 
in that third sense, a little bit of the second sense, that has always been present in their lives. But because we couldn't do anything about it, we, we became blind to it, largely blind to it. So <laughs> it's a long answer to your question, what do I mean by chaos? Uh, but you, you kind of celebrate this third kind of chaos. Um, and I, I want to ask you why, because it's disorienting to uh, certainly someone of my age, and even though I, I, uh, I'm fairly up to date on technology and things around it, I still feel like this, is, this, this has me worried a lot, including the black box element of machines having the right answer, but humans completely unable to find out why. So uh, uh, I like it for a couple of reasons. Some of the reasons are good, some are not really very interesting. The ones that's not very interesting is that um, constitutionally, I seem to resist attempts to reduce um, the phenomena of lived life to um, to reduce them to simplicities. And you know that my background from a long time ago is in philosophy. Um, I haven't been a practicing philosopher since like 1986, so I'm not making any credential claims here. Um, but part of this does go, it's one of the reasons I was interested in, and still am, it, um, uh, in particular branches of, of philosophy. Um, it, it, for whatever reason, it seemed, has seemed to me for a long time that um, the way that we construct our world is has been primarily to diminish it. Um, there are good functional reasons. What this is how we manage to give me an example of diminishing things, so people understand what you're saying when you do that. Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> one one sort of example is. Um, is an Aristotelian idea that has been incredibly powerful throughout Western culture. And I only, it's the only thing I know anything at all about. So everything I say is within that Western context. Um, so if you want to know what something is, you everything has an essence. You want to know what its essence is, you look at the category that it's in to see what it has in common with the other objects. And then you see how it's different from those things. And you end up with a hierarchy you know, with the uh, beings and then animate and inanimate and spine and no spine, and you go all the way down this, these trees, and everything is perfectly organized. Um, and part of this was a, sort of a aesthetic faith um, that the world is understandable by us, and everything is perfectly clear and distinct, which seems to be a requirement for us to understand things. But it gets picked up throughout Western history, um, it comes to mean something. Uh, particular in the uh, long Christian ages, uh, where it's God who has set up this beautiful hierarchy, of, uh, an order of being, in which everything has a meaning. And that meaning is it's a, a robin is a bird because it's got, you know, it's a feathered biped. Sorry, I'm doing, in case you don't know what a bird is, I'm flapping my arms. Um, and it's different from other birds because of whatever distinguishes it. And that's not, it seems to me, a total. Uh, I want to say fiction, it's an imposition on the world that deprives the world of much of its meaning, which comes from its messiness. It's the fact that robins are embedded in our culture in so many different ways. Not simply, it's a bird and here's how it's different, but that it's the first bird, it's a harbinger of spring. And I think, at least on the East Coast, we take it that way. Um, it, it, it's one of the first birds that, uh, that baby see, sees on the, on the East Coast. Um, Birds have so much meaning on their own. There's this incredibly messy context of, of meaning, which makes life worth living. I mean, if you know, if you want to exhaust the meaning of things because you want to have it nice, because the idea of this stable, complete, and perfect system um, pleases you for pleases one for some reason, bah, that's great. But I think it diminishes the richness of things. So I've always been attracted to messiness. Um, so. Uh, this book does, in fact, it, it's, it, it is, I admit, an odd book. Because in some ways, it's Harvard Business Review Press. So it, a lot of it talks about the meaning of this stuff for business. Um, a lot of it doesn't. And in fact, each chapter has a little coda that, which is actually, the, 
I gave it that name. I know it's the wrong name for it, but a little essay I can write at the end that lets me digress. Um, and uh, so I end up talking about things like what does meaning look like in the age of machine learning? Machine learning, for me, the sorts of models that it builds for itself are so rich and, com uh, and complex and detailed and particular um, that if, they be if that becomes the technology that gives us our sense of how the world works, then that's a very, it's a very messy uh, model of the world, but it's a very rich one. And I also think that it's, a, it's just more true. It's a true, truer representation of how the world is, which is insanely complex. M messy to us, but not to the machine. Well, I, the machine doesn't know from mess. I mean, it doesn't know from anything. It's really just, you know, strings connecting pigs. Except, you know. Uh, but if we want machines to come up with answers, uh, and especially answers that we're not clear on how they have been found, don't we have to find some ways uh, to trust the machines to have the right answers? in a way that will not be uh, gained by bad people. If, if we can't know how they got the answer, that, that, that's going to scare a lot of people. Yes, and I think it scares them for two reasons. One is the important, practical, pragmatic point you bring up. Um, but I also think that it's sort of metaphysically scary, that it's, there's a metaphysical pa panic going on. Um, and I guess I want to talk about both, but let me start with the one that you raised, which is a very pragmatic issue, so um, and a really important one, especially, especially given what we know over the past few years about the system's tendency towards bias. Because right. right, machine learning, says, so here's the difference, but, um, as I understand it, between regular computers or regular programming and machine learning. Um, regular programming, if you want to um, write a program to predict sales or predict weather. You figure out what the factors are that are involved and what the relationships are. Um, for your business, it's, uh, well, if you spend more, hire more salespeople, then that will be additional cost, so that'll go up, and maybe we'll have more sales, and you know, build a spreadsheet or whatever. And for weather, it's you know, cold. We know, I think, um, pardon me if I get the science wrong, but if cold air encounters warm, moist air, good chance of precipitation. So you build a model based on the factors and how they relate, the factors that you know. That clearly, you know, works pretty well. Machine learning, you don't do that. You pour in data. Lots and lots and lots of data. You don't tell it how you think the pieces go together, and the machine just does meaningless, I'll say meaningless um, mathematical operations, statistical operations, probing to find correlations among the many, many, many millions of points that you've put in. And um, it does this until it's tuned itself so that it's giving the correct answers for a known set that you've been training it on. And then you test it in the real world and you know, make sure that, as far as you can, that it's working in the real world too. Machine learning's models, especially neural networks, as they're known, okay, um, don't start with generalizations like, oh, here's how business works. More sales costs, then you know, more expenses. Um, it doesn't start with generalizations, may not end up with any generalizations. It may end up with some generalizations that are take place in 1,024-dimensional space. I don't know what that means either, but I know that I can't imagine it. Um, that don't correlate to how we think about things. So it, in some instances, you might see that, ah, this is the generalization that holds here, um, and not be able to figure out why. So um, trusting them. Um, there, there are clearly places where we want to know how it came up with this, down to a, a fault, um, where uh, uh, where trust in the explanations is essential for societal reasons, as in a judicial system, where being told, why did I get seven years and, and this guy over here only got four and he's white and I'm not? Why? And it's probably, at least for a while, not going to be acceptable to say, well, we don't know. The machine said so. Uh, have an, you know, enjoy your extra three years in jail. Probably not going to be acceptable. We, we require faith, some level of faith anyway, in the judicial system for it to work. Um, there are other places where uh, we, we use it now. Nobody cares. 
weather reports. I have no idea how they work. It's machine learning. No idea how they work. As long as it's uh, as long as it's being more accurate than they used to be, I'm very, very happy, and I suspect almost everybody is. Um, uh, well, as you point out in in your writing, the uh, computers doing weather forecasts used to take longer to do the forecast than the day was long, yeah. so it didn't help much. But that was a long time ago. They have gotten a little better, um, but yeah, that was a pretty great case. One of the first but, tests. But they are getting they're getting really good at things like hurricane tracks and that sort of thing. But there's some there's a there's a difference in character uh, from the the not very many years ago the advent of what people called supercomputers, where the, the the mode was and method was brute force. You learned every chess move there was, and and whatever the opponent was doing, it just figured out and looked looked way ahead down the game. And said, "Oh, okay. This is the appropriate move for here. This is what's going on now is different. And I, I, I think it's important that people understand. So can you explain what is the difference now from brute force computing, which was, you know, pretty big step in its own right? Um, well, it, so the old way, which in many instances is all you need. Um, you give in the case of chess, you would give it the rules." Um, and uh, weights, I think, of the pieces. I, I'm not a computer developer, or computer scientist, but I'm going to do the best I can. Um, so there are more, more inputs? inputs? No, it's, it's thoroughly different. Uh, let me give you a different sort of example. Okay, so, um, so for a long time, we made pretty good progress uh, coming up with um, translation software, language translation software, by specifying the rules of language and specifying for each word what part of speech it is, and telling the, you know, the system what types of words can go next to others, and you can you can do pretty well. Um, I think it was in the '90s, um, and I think it was IBM. But as you know, anything that I say factually is undoubtedly wrong. That uh, IBM. Isn't there a machine we can track with? <laughs> <laughs> if only we had a small device in our pockets that would allow us to check facts. Um, uh, IBM took Hansard, the Canadian uh, parliamentary proceedings that's published in French and, and English, and just fed them in to a machine that looked for statistical correlations um, among the literal dis di um, distances be between words, which words went together, how clusters of them and the like, without having any idea about what parts of speech, whether it was French or it was English, I mean, what the words mean, nothing. Just a statistical correlation. And if I'm getting this right, it actually outperformed the one that we were trying to teach how language works. This is essentially how we do translation, the translation companies you know, do it now. And it keeps getting better and better because it turns out with enough data, at least in many fields, including many fields of human agency, which is a metaphysically depressing thing, uh, you can make predictions. You can, you can uh, translate, make predictions better than you can by trying to specify the rules. It is a fundamentally different way of doing things. Uh, I'll give you a couple of other examples. That's okay. Um, there's a uh, a few months ago, which probably means a couple of years ago, because that's what they do, um, uh, some computer scientists, machine learning folks, f fed in a whole bunch of retinal scans. And the machine iterates on, it's, the, it's just images, right? It's just images. It doesn't know anything about it. It doesn't know it's an eye. It doesn't know those are veins. This is a phobia, whatever that is. What, you know, it doesn't know anything. It just is looking at images, and it was able to predict things that we did not know were encoded, so to speak, in the eye, like the person's, uh, person's sex and some heart health indicators, raising the sort of clickbaity possibility that someday a doctor will hold uh, these and know whether you're going to have a heart attack. There was very recently, actually, um, uh, a study that was a, is, claimed 100% accuracy, which worries me a little bit because these are probabilistic machines. But that it's 100% accurate in predicting the uh, the on um, the onset of a heart problem of some sort. I didn't read it that carefully, based upon a single heartbeat. This was a, among a set of uh, people who had heart histories of heart disease. So, uh, but a single heartbeat, um, and it may be for the retinal. 
nobody can figure out what the machine is seeing. The doctors can't, the computer scientists can't. But if it turns out that the retinal scans work in predicting or doing a better job than other more expensive, perhaps, um, uh, ways of, uh, of checking, if they work, then if I go in and it says, uh, looks like you're, you better, whatever, you know, whatever problem I have, I'm going to take care of it as best I can, even though nobody knows how it works. But it's different in different areas. And it gets really difficult in areas where, we, where there are histories of bias. We are, um, are rightfully very suspicious and we hope careful about those. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll be intrigued if the prediction of, of health issues, is, if it's uh, like, more likely to predict uh, th health issues that need expensive treatment as opposed to ones that can be treated inexpensively. That will be an interesting test. It, it will be an interesting test. Um, uh, I, I'm also interested in what we will do if it turns out it's way more accurate, let's just imagine, I don't know, way more accurate for white men than it is for young women of color. This Right now, I'm making this up, it's hypothetical, but it's not hard to imagine circumstances well, like given, that given, we'll have to decide. Given most programmers are young white men, that's, uh, we, that's got a real influence on how the machines begin to learn. Um, so I guess I want to say two things. First is I, I would look first to the data um, where there's likely to be some hidden variables that are proxies for gender or whatever. Um, it, and this, um, second thing is that you you do want to watch out for that sort of bias because one of the things, that, so I've been embedded in a machine learning research group for about a year as a, as a writer in residence, so I get to hang out with some really good researchers. And one of the things that has surprised me as a neophyte um, is the extent to which, um, so I described it basically machine learning, you pour in data and then it iterates. And the, yeah, that's true enough. But it iterates under the careful hand of a human practitioner who, sa who says, Oh man, that didn't work. That thing didn't train itself. Oh, I bet I know what it is. And there's there are knobs and things that uh, parameters they call them hyperparameters that they can adjust. And they can look at the data too. That's the first place they're going to look. Um, there's a lot of human intervention, both in turning those knobs to get the desired outcomes, and in many cases, the definition of what a desired outcome is. And that itself is a huge, really interesting and potentially dangerous area. Who gets to decide? Uh, what these things are optimized for. I think we better leave it at that so that you have time to uh, actually get to your talk today. Uh, and revise it in light of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay.